Christine. Hello. Hi, Peter. Hey. Hi, Peter. It's so fun to be back here with you. The last time I saw your face was um, for the very first OllieCon three years ago, if you can believe it. Wow. Um, and your talk was, um, you know, so many people came up afterwards and told me how how amazing it was, and it was their favorite one. And and we were just like, phew, we would, we invited an academic, and it went well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, congratulations from all of us on your tenure. Oh my God! Thank you so much. <laughs> It's been such a long time coming, but I couldn't be more delighted. So well about deserved. It. We're oh so my excited God. for you. So excited. So one of the things that we did to prepare for this conversation was um, I went back and rewatched your talk from three years ago, and one of the phrases stood out to me as sort of being evergreen and also something that we're trying to chip away at. Um, you called. You said something about a faraway land like production. Yeah. Um, and I love that phrase because for so much of Charity and I working together, our relationship has been about, you know, Charity is this like ops persona where production is her world and, you know, she speaks the language and, and everything. And I'm a developer where I live in dev and I, I write code that then gets put into production and then, and then when fireworks we were at parse, ensue. The seating <laughs> charts were literally... he. he Kevin seated us by how close we were to production. So I was over here on one wall and Christine we went back end, front end. And then there was Christine literally over on the other wall. And we almost never spoke to each other. <laughs> <laughs> and it felt like a different land, right? It felt like a, uh, you know, they spoke, they, they used words I didn't really know how to work with. And, you know, I was over here writing my tests and my code. Uh, um, and they were there talking about, you know, write throughput and yeah. database uptime. And it was, it, it did feel like a foreign land. And so I loved that. Um, I love that phrasing. And yet it can't be right. And I feel like part of what we're out to do is to like help raise a new generation of engineers who, who are, who are like production native, right. Where it's not a faraway land to them, where it's, it's where they live because guess what? It's where your users live. Right. <laughs> I would really love to better understand how we can realize this vision. So, you know, I, before I was an academic, I, I did work in industry and I had come from ops. I was a DBA and then I was an operations person before I clawed my way into dev. And I really, I clawed my way into dev. I didn't want to be an ops person. I didn't want to be on call. But I always said yeah. when I was a developer that I, 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 I never forgot where I came from. You know what I mean? <laughs> in, in those days, there was a big wall between those two worlds and stuff got, obviously, stuff got thrown over it. Yeah, And I think there's actually been a lot of interesting academic work. I'm thinking about uh, some of the work by my colleague, uh, Chan Yin Zhu, on tooling to help production operations people deal with bugs introduced potentially by devs. So debugging, yeah. for example, configuration. And he kind of made a name for himself, emphasizing the, how, how different these two worlds were, right? Like, um, the devs can't debug production config issues because the devs aren't the people setting the values in the production config. The mm -hmm. ops people are, but the ops yeah. people don't know the code well enough to understand the consequences of a missetting of those configuration files. Right. So he built up a whole bunch of tooling to kind of, if there's a bug in the configuration file, force the system to crash fast well, this is so the whole, that they could enlist the help of devs. But this is the whole it, moral between config is code, right? Your config is code. You can't separate the two. And and, and increasingly, like oh, even five years ago, you know, you'd, you'd hear devs going, oh, I don't want to be on call. That's where I'm a dev. Well, now they are on call, right? Like over the past five years, it's become, it's, it's become a given now. If you write code in production, you should be on call for that code. And this has been kind of a sea change and it's both good and bad, right? Like it's good because... Increasingly, if you didn't write the code, you have no hope of of maintaining it in production. Like you, you ops people can no longer black box this shit. You you just you, you can't right. Um, and and I feel like a lot of teams then are just using this as an as an a, a excuse to like make devs as miserable as ops people have been. And granted, we have a big <laughs> problem with with masochism, right? Like there's a grenade, well, I'll fall on it, right? <laughs> But the, but the point is not to make everyone as miserable as us people have historically been. It's, the point is that this is the only way to make systems better, right? This is the way to make systems not that terrible. This is the way that, like, if, you know, if you're saying devs need to be on call, then your management has to say just equally as much that it's not going to suck, right? It's not going to interrupt you. I think it's reasonable to ask someone to wake up to, to, to fix their code once or twice a year. More than that is it's just abusive. 
Hmm. I, I, hmm, I feel really ambivalent about breaking down the wall though. Um, because I think that as systems get larger and get more complicated, we're going to need some modicum of modularity. There's going to have to be boundaries to what somebody is an expert in. Mm -hmm. And there is something nice yeah. about the vision of SREs and ops people are experts in observability tools. They don't look inside the box. They look outside the box. They understand mm -hmm. how the boxes compose and work together at a higher level. The devs, by contrast, mm -hmm. are inside the box, right? It looks like abstraction in programming. But unfortunately, I don't think it works. I think the kinds of architectures of, 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 uh, you know, uh, of, of the large scale web based companies that we're porous. seeing, not just in e-commerce, they're, they're, they're porous and they're just gigantic. Like I can't yeah. understand how my code is going to behave without understanding everything it depends on and everything that depends on it at Absolutely. any given time no single person might even be able to enumerate all the potential dependencies of a service that you've deployed. The only way I think, at least in the limit, as systems get more complicated, the only way to see what code does is to see what it does out in production. It's not as though yep. we have staging areas that are faithful that will show right. <laughs> all the ways in which an I'm API will be exercised. You have to put Facebook it out there and look. <laughs> right. Well, that's you what, have, that's what it would to. appear to be required to do classic development, right? Um, yep. And classic debugging. Um, I don't, yep. I like debugging, I, you know, I, I'm thinking it's about our conversation from last week and, and, you know, where I was making this argument that debugging and sort of incident response are two totally different things, despite the right. fact that they, you know, you, you, you use similar parts of your brain, you're reasoning differentially, but the, the sort of labor of the programmer finding a root cause versus the labor of the SRE uh, relieving pressure are different. And you kind of push back and you were like, no, actually they're the same and they're going to have to be the same. And over the last week, I think I've, I think I've, I think I've come around. I think that like, like, yeah, I, I, well, I, I they, think they I are different that. in a way, but they aren't so different in practice. Right. And, and like, one of the things that I often say about observability is it, it's about, it's not about debugging the code. It's about finding where in the system is the code that you need to debug. Right. Yeah. Which is, which is kind of the hardest part. Like, like once Lo you figure that out. Yeah. One of yeah. the, one of the things I, again, like the, the foreignness, there's a there's a real language that developers speak, and it's the language of our tests. It's the language of the code. It's the business logic. It's the it's the pieces that cause that you go back to, and you're like, how can I construct a test case to reproduce this thing that I'm seeing in the, in the tool? Um, and this, I had this huge light bulb moment the other day, a while ago, when I realized that one of the reasons I struggled so much with understanding the tools that Charity's team were using and and kind of handing to the devs was that they were all tools that spoke ops language, mm -hmm. all CPU and, and throughput. And, and, and I was sitting there being like, well, how, how do I map this back to a test case so that I can fix the thing that's causing the problem? Aren't, yeah. don't, you, don't you think that traces are, are, are potentially the lingua franca for connecting those two worlds? Because traces, traces are, are, say again? Traces are a structure. Uh, traces still have to handle all the you know high cardinality data that that we talk about. It's it's when you think about um, the values that go into test cases, they are by nature high cardinality values. They're going to be user types, or there's going to they're going to be um, you know I don't know they're going to be blog posts with zero comments versus five hundred comments. Like these are the sorts of things that you're throwing in there. Not and traces play a big part. Traces I think help developers feel like. Production but it's looks that, the same. It's that, like for a long time, ops people have been the translation layer between developers who are writing their shit and the low level underlying system components. And I think that what we are seeing is 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 that increasingly you can separate the. I've got orange on Cheetos. <laughs> I had Cheetos last night. Um, I, I think that you can increasingly separate. You know, devs shouldn't have to care about system resources at a very low level. They, they they need to know if they just shipped a change, did it triple the memory usage? Sure. Right. Do they need to know all the stuff under slash proc, all of the different like types of memory usage? No, they shouldn't have to, right? That should be something that Amazon deals with or whoever is provisioning your infrastructure deals with. That's a true native ops use case that should be increasingly isolated because what you should care about as a dev is can my user execute my code from end to end in a reasonable amount of time? The first right? thing that you and, said, like what I care about is my deploy, that's a thing that right. makes sense in my world. Yeah. Everything else, it's like, okay, 
hey, charity, my employee caused this. Let's let's work together to figure out what it means and you know what to what to do about the memory increase. But but like translating like something that Honeycomb does that I think you know other companies are starting to come around to is that is that you should only have to deal with with your code and your systems in terms of like endpoints and variables and functions and this higher order of, of things like you know teams that have SREs now. Um, shouldn't really have to have dashboards of, of, of all of this low level like hardware shit because it should be abstractable away enough so that you can just, if this isn't working, like you, you fail it and you try another one, you know, you should be able to, right. even the SRE should be able to manage it at a much higher level now. And I think that, you know, the traditional metrics use cases are increasingly the, they are the domain and they will always be the domain of whoever is dealing with low level infrastructure stuff. But that is from the perspective of the of the of the infrastructure itself it's like am i healthy am i accepting connections do i have enough you know how's my provisioning do i need a provision for capacity stuff that that is a separate set of concerns from is my code executing are my users happy and i do think you can increasingly like separate them I think I completely agree. And I think, so Christine, you were kind of drawing this distinction between like the, the, the system, quantifiable system measures that the old fashioned ops people used to care about versus the maybe quantifiable application measures. And the reason I mentioned tracing is because tracing is a story that connects yeah. system measures and application measures. Because it's like, tell me one user or one requests story and like, why did this take longer than it expected to? That answer is gonna involve reasoning about how the application code uses resources and also about whether the resources were adequately, whether the capacity was there, right? Whether the resources were adequately provisioned. And I agree with you, Charity, although again, I only make brief sojourns in industry. I mean, I do think that SRE teams, like at the end of the day, it is the app yeah. that everybody cares about because it's yeah. the app that the customers interact that's, with. That's the, why the, the capacity exists. has to be there and somebody has to make sure that the capacity is there, yeah. but SREs are looking at app level metrics yes. as well. Um, yes. and, and the need for ops and SREs are, is not going away by any means. It's just that we're more like consultants. We're more like high level experts in mm. here's how you do these things the right way. Right. But we can't like, like, I like that, you know, a, the model that a lot of companies have taken is, you know, if you're a dev team, you're building, you're building to spec, right. And when you've reached the spec, maybe the SREs will take it over and run it for you or, or they'll just like be in your rotation with you or, or something like that. But, but they're not going to get involved until you've like, You've you've done you've you've made it you know instrumented and you've made it you know restart it cleanly and you, you're using you know the golden path that the you know we've invested in as a as a company and that sort of thing. You mentioned dashboards. Can I ask a controversial question? Absolutely. Are dashboards good <laughs> for anything? It's my, you, know, you were talking a moment ago uh, or before we started about, you know, uh, you know, what was observability? What is it now? And where is it going? And I'm inclined to say it was like those dashboards, lots of money spent on big things that I don't see what the and, and like, I feel like the current state of the art is like these really quite sophisticated UIs yeah. that are way better than a dashboard because yeah. they're interactive, but they're my, still just like one view of the world. And I think the future is going to be like querying these signals in rich ways it's like i want to go out and do exploratory i swear to god analysis. we did not prepare this we did not <laughs> we did not no, no I, feel, I, mean, I will often say that you know every dashboard is just like an artifact of some past failure it's like we figured uh, it out we create a dashboard we're like we're gonna find this immediately next time and now we've got just like this graveyard of like tens of thousands of littered dashboards you know many of which are no longer even receiving data and it's just like this is not how because every time you have a dashboard you're jumping to the answer and you're assuming you're looking for evidence that you're right Right, you're not actually exploring it or trying to like ask the question, figure out this new, the the, the current state of things. You're just like, was it that? Was it that? Was it that? Was it that? Is it, it stops your mind from actually debugging or thinking about the problem in any systematic way. And yet, it gives you this um, illusion of, of 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 witnessing all of, the signals. Of being like God, you're right? like you're God. like, well, you're like yeah. I see everything. Single point of glass, isn't that what they say? Single pane of glass. It's not <laughs> helpful. I will, I will offer a slightly contrasting opinion, which is that, like all things, in moderation, used sparingly, <laughs> right? It's, it's good to have starting entry points. points. Exactly. Yeah. There they should have be points. jumping off points where you, you have things that your users care about. And this is, you know, this sort of speaks to our philosophy and SLOs. But there should be a small set of things that are user impacting. Yes. That then you use as the jumping off points into, mm -hmm. into, the, into that investigation into that investigative process. And this the is problem where... is that most people have taken those the dashboard model and, and applied it to 
because it's the only killers. thing that they've they've had. They're just like, and, and it's a very it's a very compelling like fresh user experience. If you're like, I I ran one thing and now I have the world opening up to me. All these dashboards, and it isn't until you get it isn't until you get into the thick of things that you're like, but what are they telling me? Right, I've got many many dashboards. What do they mean? Because any any computer can like tell you that there is a spike or something, but only humans could impose meaning on it. Maybe the right. spike is good. Maybe it was desired. Maybe it was expected. Maybe it's anticipated. Well, and you know, the spike you, itself as an artifact is not an interesting thing to stare at, right? You want the exactly. context. You want the context for the spike and you want to maybe compare it to other things, but staring yes. at two graphs and understanding how they're related is something that our brains aren't that good at, right? Correct. So I, like, if I have to look at two pictures to understand something, I'm already screwing yeah. up. Yeah. I would agree. Uh, but I do think that the, the being fit. And, and so like one of the, the two things that helped Honeycomb reach product market fit where, you know, doing the beeline so that you just added a library and auto instrumented a bunch of stuff and adding like the APM home, which is, which has landed you with the same three graphs that you see everywhere, latency, request rate and errors, because that gave people a comfortable place to start from instead of just landing them in an open, like query, like query interface where they were just like, what am I doing here? What do I look for? You know, it was it was terrifying. So I, I think that they are necessary as jumping off points. Um, but, you know, I, I feel like the, we in ops need to stop pattern matching. We need to stop leaning on our, our past scars and our, and our you know, our, our library of past outages, which, which make us feel like wizards, right? Like, mm-hmm. I know what it is. You know, it's my sequel. Uh, but we need to be more in the mindset of, of debugging and iterating and like, like being in a state of flow, just like understanding our system step by step, by step like much more, much more like stepping through, you know, a GDB output or something like that, like devs do. Yeah, not 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 a sequential stepwise debugging in all likelihood, right? Because we're in a <laughs> distributed system and we don't have total orders. Right. And but I agree. I mean, this piecewise like Q and A, right? Like mm-hmm. like in the same way that when a, when when a data scientist gets a new data set. Yeah. First, they're going to ask these really shallow queries, like min, max, like what's the shape of the data? Yeah. And then you start you start refining your queries, going back and forth. And then the final query is actually the query that says, uh, how? T- tell me the story of the system in terms of the system metrics, in terms of the app metrics, in terms of the traces before this incident, and explain what all the good executions had in common that the bad yeah. executions happening during this incident don't have in common, whether that's labels, whether that's yeah. spans that are longer than we expected, whether that's actual structural differences and traces, like yeah. that's kind of where I want to go. And then w- when we get there, the distinction between debugging and localization really will go- have gone away because localization was just a shallow query that you only had a few minutes to do because you were leaking, you were hemorrhaging money versus right. root cause analysis, if you'll forgive the term, uh, w- which is just the same thing with more iterations going deeper. Right, because an SRE doesn't want the root cause; they want like the closest right. cause, the right. lever that I can pull. Right, right. Get me back to good as quickly yeah. as we can, and as then we'll quick figure as it we out can, afterwards. and then we'll sort it out. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I've got a question for both of you about the the far future. Ten years. So it feels like the first chunk of our call, we were talking about, you know, the the sharp boundary that we had between ops and dev, and us moving to try and blur that boundary a little bit. 10 years from now, what new boundaries are going to be in place? And what will the, you know, are we, are we, are we trying to build them or blur them? Well, I, I think that um, one answer to this is, is that, you know, I think that, you know, the dev, the DevOps movement, if you look at it from a broad, you know, big picture, like it, it was a split that never really should have happened, um, hmm. but it did because, you know, because because specialization, right? Um, and then the first wave of DevOps was very much about ops people, you must learn to write code. Okay, mm-hmm. okay. You know, and then the second half is like, okay, software engineers, like it's your turn, right? Learn to be involved in operating your services, learn to build operable services, you know, learn to instrument, learn to understand your stuff. Um, and, and, and I think that like, you know, when I think of the most powerful engineers on the planet right now, they are the people who sit there at that nexus, right? They're the people who could write the code, who can write the big systems, who can also jump in and understand them and debug them and operate them. Like those people have superpowers. And I think that you see a lot of aspiration on behalf of engineers who come from both sides to, to reach that point. And I think that's where we are right now is we're, we're trying to like help accelerate that. Right. We're trying to help like the Dora. Met- if you look at the Dora metrics, you know, you see like the top 50 percent are getting better. The bottom 50 percent are getting worse. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, I, I think that like over the next you know, five, 10 years, 
I think that's going to accelerate. I do think that we need to figure out how to reach that bottom 50%. And I don't think this is so much a technical thing as I think we need to help them leapfrog, you know, a decade or so of, of, of fear, <laughs> of fear. I, I also think that like the specialization that's going to occur more in the future is going to be less about dev versus ops. It's going to be more about types of industries almost like, like the, 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 the framework that we're often implicitly talking about is like big web applications, right? That's right. When, when we're talking about something by default, it's that, right? Well, people who do like embedded programming and people who do like medical devices and people who do like even good, mobile good. and stuff, like they have a very different set of, you know, starting points and workflows. And, and I think that DevOps looks very different there. I think those boundaries will be maybe harder to, harder to cross. So Charity, you're an animal. Uh, the things you say are so content rich. Let me see if I can respond to all of the amazing things you just said. So like, there's two things I definitely want to respond to. So the first is like, yes, as I said before, we have to cut at the joint somewhere as systems get bigger and have more people contributing to them <laughs> and are running on larger numbers of computers. We can't just be omniscient. And so yeah. I like this idea of sort of vertical chopping right? That there's going to be diff a different pile of DevOpsy skills that are relevant yeah. to different industries. And beginning to like articulate what those are is, is, is a path to the future. So I think that's, I think that's great because, because we have to partition somewhere. Like yeah. this is, this we is We can't insane. all just be everything to everyone. I also liked what you said about the superheroes, because as you may recall, that was like a big theme of my talk from three years ago, right? Which yeah. is that we've, we've gotten ourselves into this position where there are these super experts who like we don't really remember or know how they were trained yeah which means we can't get them really to train anyone it. else and in some sense like in some sense this is true about all sres that like sres they're apprenticed in right nobody yeah. knows how you train an sre how you train an sre is you bring them into the war room you sit 100%. them next to a, a veteran sre and eventually it leaches into them and sure, you might have some run books, but the thing about the run books is like who's yep. keeping them up to the date and things like that, right? So you really don't have like documentation. You just plop them in. And to be fair, I mean, this is how like PhDs and professors are trained too. Like we haven't figured out how to train them either. Totally. There's certain classes of people that were like, oh, these people are super smart. So let's not like try to improve the process of how we create right. them. So I think like, and this isn't, Christine, to answer your question, this isn't like where the industry is going, but I think it's a crisis that the industry needs to solve. Yeah. Certainly hasn't gotten any better in the last three years, no. which is like, how do we train people yeah. to, to be yeah. omniscient in this sense, to be able to understand the dev and the ops? This is an argument side. that Liz and I have a lot. Well, not an argument. I think we vigorously agree, which is that, you know, so many of us who came up from systems land, we, we, we crawled in, like we scraped our way in by our fingernails, you know, like... I have a dropout, a music major dropout. I didn't even go to high school, right? Like, and people like me are increasingly, there are not, not many avenues into the industry for people like me anymore. It used to be like, if you could sit there and learn a Linux yeah. computer, there was a job for you somewhere. It's not the case anymore. And I, and I worry about that a lot because it is an apprenticeship industry. Yeah, I, I was an English major in college. And, and I think about this a lot, Charity, about how like, I can't give people advice about people ask me for advice. How do you get into computers? How do you get into tech? You and I'm like, and I don't I'm not going to gonna be them. one of these jerks who's like, oh, it worked for me. So you should just do what I did. You should, you should do English. And then, yeah. you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so the, the, the answer can't be exceptional people like you. We need to keep finding completely exceptional people. I don't think that I, I am an exceptional person. I think that there were avenues open for people who are stubborn, you know, to work their way in that just aren't open anymore. Because if I, if there's one thing special about me, it's probably just my persistence and tolerance for pain, but that's really <laughs> it. <laughs> you know, the analogy that I, I it was coming to mind as you two are talking, um, people love to bemoan like, oh, kids these days, they can't take a computer apart. They like have these like nice walled gardens. Um, you know, they have the Robloxes and the, the, the cool like mind store, I don't know cool kid things um, but things are packaged, <laughs> no, that's, I right? bought it that sounded right that's great like my great thank you <laughs> the cool kid things uh sorry packaged things and yeah. in a way I think this is what Charity and I have been pushing against this whole time in our world right we don't want people to accept that their software is this beautifully packaged thing that only this you know magical agent can can plug into and understand we want people to be willing to take it apart and look at the guts and put something mm -hmm. in here and see what happens. And it's, um, it's almost like our kind of reversal of the glossy packaging promise. Yeah. And correspondingly, it's been hard to get, you know, for folks to be like, well, what do you mean I have to do this again? 
but once once people get over that mental yeah that mental hump um one of my favorite phrases i'm going to borrow from another talk uh that i heard a couple years ago is it was a it was a new engineer uh fairly early in her career sitting next to an experienced ops person and described what she was seeing as leaps of intuition akin to magic yeah 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 like how how do we um it was logan at monodorama oh i'd love to i'd love to from see buzzfeed this. Um, so I think 2018 or 2019 definitely um, confirms my biases. <laughs> it and it does, and it's 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 her whole talk was great because um, they're talking about how to learn, how mm -hmm. to build this sort of apprenticeship motion, how to um, you know do this transferring be, of knowledge and expertise. What could be what could be really interesting is. Like so cool. the more that we lean into this, the harder it gets to sell to sea levels <laughs> because they really want to hear just, just give me 10 million bucks and you'll never have to understand your system again. No one will ever yeah. have to understand your system again. They want to make the people fungible because of course they do. That's, that's their job is to make sure there are no single points of failure. But in fact, you can't like, you just honestly can't. You really like our whole our whole mission is leaning into the idea that, you know, you have to help humans do what humans are good at, which is, you know, attaching meaning to things um, and, and you have to center that the engineer and make it more, make them more powerful and more important in a way. And, and, and instead of less important and, and, and replaced by machines that will just magically tell you the right answer. In my experience, that's just hundred percent false. <laughs> this really is a rough trade-off space to be running a startup in, I got to say. So I was thinking a moment <laughs> ago, like, you know, you, you know, remember you'd said that like, it's this auto instrumentation has been huge. And certainly for like the, the tracing community, like yeah. creative ways to use aspect oriented it helps. programming it helps or annotations or whatever, for sure. it takes away the pain. But the thing takes is, away the pain. if you take away too much of the pain, you haven't they don't forced learn. devs to trace their way through this the is, code. This is How not are you going to understand code that you haven't exactly. instrumented a little exactly. bit, for God's sake? What exactly. a horrible trade-off. You, you, have, you have to do the hybrid model. You have to make them instrument their code some. You can make it easy. You can make it as easy as doing a printf, right? But that's the easiest you can make it. You have to make them think about, how is future me going to understand this once it's deployed? What am I going to need to look for to see if, if, if everything is working as planned? You have to bake that, that expectation into the way that you write and ship code, or they're not going to get there. Right. Yeah. And so I like the but idea the, that you're embracing the porous nature. But the good, of the but the system, good thing is, but it's is, a lot of work. But these are these are engineers. Like we got into this because we we love that dopamine hit of finding something and experimenting and and getting the you know so many people have had this drummed out of them. They've had their tools punish them for for being curious <laughs> and for exploring. And we're really trying to reawaken that that joy and that love of oh that's what it was. Oh I can see it. Oh I don't have to guess. Oh there it is. I can see my user having the problem. I can I can mm -hmm. correlate to, oh shit, all these other users are having the same problem. I can figure it out and fix it before anyone complains. That is a high that once you get them hooked on, they have a really hard time going back. Yeah, man, I buy that. I buy that. That's awesome. Well, uh, it looks like we're about out of time, but Peter, would you like to put on your very fancy new uh, tenured professor hat and tell us what we're going to be talking about at Olicon three years from now? <laughs> oh my gosh, you know, this is going to be, so, you're going to be so disappointed with this answer. The same thing. But things. we're going to be having a really similar <laughs> conversation three years yeah, from now because there. this is, this, this movement is new. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I wish I could report on bigger changes over the last three years, but to some extent, I'm still waiting for tracing yeah. to get rolled out at the level of granularity that I want it to do my stuff. So much so that I've gotten tired of waiting and I have some students in my lab writing their own tracers, doing things yeah. a little bit differently and screwing around with hybridizing tracing and fault injection because I can't wait. Industry moves slowly uh, uh, <laughs> for, my, for, my, for my tastes, you know? Um, and so I think like we'll, we'll have made some progress. Yeah. We'll have better tooling and we'll be asking bigger questions, but it's going to be a very similar conversation to the one we're having that, now, I think in three more years. I think we've seen a little bit more progress than you've seen. Good. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming and talking to us. It was a delight as always. Yeah, what a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for your time.